For decades, buying a silencer has been difficult. But in 2005, Silencer Central set out to simplify the suppressor buying process. So whether you're planning your next hunt or putting together a range day, you'll enjoy every shot you take with Silencer Central, straight to your front door. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Mike Force Podcast presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company. Uh, it's your host, Mike. Hey, if you didn't know it, Phil Craft Survival is in most retail locations in Black Rifle Coffee's coffee shops. So I've been asked, like, hey, how can we get... Uh, Phil Craft Survival Swag, Gear, uh, First Aid, Survival. Go to your local Black Rifle Coffee is how you could do it. I am honored and privileged to have my next guest, Matt Graham. Apparently, we say, uh, share the same initials, and he's stolen everything. Even though I was going to gift him something, he's stolen everything inside because he claims like this coaster. He just stole that coaster. I, mean, I appreciate the fact that you did this for me. This is some high levels. This isn't even on my writer. Yeah, like, it's It was yours. just I need to have coffee and sparkling water but now we have like <laughs> things with my initials on them we have a leather smith in the back that is custom for the guest yeah you're welcome i appreciate you're it welcome. so i want to kick this off by giving you a gift oh um my my wife will tell you that my love, love language is gifting so i'm, I'm down for this what this is a phil craft survival um 20 liter which we include first aid and survival the ability to kind of access that stuff i didn't have a i didn't have a giant shirt the size giant. Okay. Um, Do you have a grown, that's a, that's grown a, man? That's an XL. You might have to okay. sew two no. of them together. No, I'm not. I'm, in order I'm, to... Yeah. Matt Graham is like the biggest human being I've ever met. Like it's Neanderthal. A, when Andre the Giant died, right before he texted me, <laughs> he, he was like, jeans. hey man, you got to do it for me. And <laughs> a like, hat. For and then, hey look, I'm going to give you this coaster too. Let's let's give you one of these. Let's give nice. you that coaster, man. Nice. That coaster was given to me by a get... Or not a guest, but a, a person who... Um, bartered with me when I gave them honey and we swapped custom leather goods for honey. So that's am yours. I not? So before you zip that closed, uh -oh. am I not getting honey? You can, oh, I'll get, I got okay, a jar okay, upstairs. Okay. I was just going to say, got a jar upstairs for okay. you. Here's your gift. That's yours. Well, since we're gifting. Oh, <laughs> I like how you're one up in me. Huge there. What just is this? a little token of my appreciation? That is uh, Aries diver one date model. Uh, in sand, a Cerakote diver one. Sand. That's the top of the line. I mean, it's a. Uh, it's what we do. Everything we have is top of the line. Thank you for minimizing. Um, so yeah, that's in Cerakote sand. Oh my gosh. With our sand strap, and you being the sand man, you've been around a bit. So uh, hell there you go. yeah. Thank just, you so much for that, man. Just tr put that in the bag that I get. Wow. So. Jesus. Um, did you just put my uniform once and uh, watch on your back? You did. <laughs> it has my initials on it. Th thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Look at this. Yeah. So we're uh, we're Cerakoting now. Oh. So we went down and met with them yep. business to business and are full up. We we recreated their entire Cerakote shop yeah. on site at Aries. So when we have Cerakote issues and we take a picture of what we're doing, and they open it up. It looks exactly like the guys in their shop doing it. So we can one to one get things finished. This so. is amazing. I, I just did a podcast on Jack Carr's podcast. Okay, and uh, was in studio with him. Um, He's got a few. Yeah, he does. <laughs> it, it, this is his new series, uh, season three podcast, where he does uh, the guest on site, uh -huh. and I he pulled off his Eris watch. We talked about you on the podcast. I think Tulsa Gabber was one. I was guest two, and this comes out in January, so a little bit after this. But um, he pulled it off and showed me, and it was the watch you did for him, which is the what, is it a terminalist edition? Yeah, so it's the yeah. it's the one that he was wearing in the terminalist. Yeah, and we provided a whole Pelican case full of everything we make, from diver ones to GMTs to yeah. autos. For production. So pre-production, they reached out to us and said, what do you got? Yeah. Um, because it's me, like they asked for two or three watches, and I sent them a Pelican case full of everything we make, multiples of them. That's awesome. Uh, with tomahawks on the back. We custom engraved tomahawks. So if you come across one of those in the wild, they're, I don't think Very they're rare. in the wild. Yeah. Um, and then the one he wore, he wanted to launch for brand, like let's create that and let people get it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that didn't last long. No, they're all limited editions. So what he and I are doing are limited edition pieces every year for like the next few years. And we've already planned them out. 
we know yeah. what they are. They're going to get into not only Diver Ones, but we're going to introduce like the Field Watch. Like this is a brand new piece oh, that nobody's seen. Look at that beautiful yeah, watch. So this is this is pretty slick. So you want to swap a Rooney? Uh, <laughs> you want to look at it? Like, I don't. I mean, we don't have to take time now looking at it. But yeah, that's the. Let me see that thing. That's yeah. Look at that, man. So what's what what model watch is this? That's the Field One. So Dude, you're wearing a clean. diver one. That's the field one. Yeah. So this that's, looks very agency. Yeah. That, <laughs> I'm allowed to say that. This well, looks, it depends. Um, now in the world, people, you know, they take their agency and they, they're <laughs> able to. So yeah, you're on brand regardless of it. what you do. It's a beautiful um, watch. And then that, that band. So my dad was a Vietnam guy, which I have to, I'm going to get to a thank you real quick for that. Uh, a tie in to you that you don't know about mm -hmm. with my father. Um, and he had a band like this. He had a Timex when he was, he was in Vietnam from 67 to 70. Yeah. He was an army guy. Oh. Um, and he had a band. So when I was growing up, his watch had a band like this. So we had these bands made like two years ago. And when I would put them on the diver one, it just didn't fit. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I always wanted to make a field watch. I always wanted to do a chrono. There, there, there's other models that I'm creating. So when I made the field watch, I'm like, man, that fits that fits the metal band that fits all of that stuff. Yeah. So it, um, it perfectly b blends with the actual does. time. Yeah. Piece. yeah. It's a good, it's that, a good fit. That's yeah. one of the issues that I've, well, I guess I should introduce you. Uh, we were, oh yeah. We, we jumped, we, we jumped, jumped, jumped a little bit. Uh, let me, let me just go to this real quick. Cause I'll forget it. Not, TBI. That, that's, that's a thing. Um, I like, I love your straps. No watches that I've bought, even high end watches, which I would consider a sin. You, yeah, you very won. Much a great watch. Yeah. The band sucks. Yeah. And it has the metal band, but I hated the way it felt like on my skin because it like it would pinch and stuff. Mm -hmm. So then I went to the rubber sin band and the pins drift, all three of the pins drift. There's hacks for them, but it's like it's a three thousand dollar watch. Like yeah. why am I hacking pins drifting in a three thousand dollar watch? But your band I've never had any issues with. Why are you having to do hacks on MP5s and HK and 91s? Right, exactly. like it's a German thing. So it's yeah. like, hey, yeah. or even a Porsche. You're like, yeah. hey, you gotta, you gotta tune. So what I did um, when I wanted to do a rubber band, rubber. There's differences within rubber, the durometer or sponginess of rubber, the type of rubber. Yeah. And what I did was I would throw my three piece Fox News suit on. Yeah. And I would go to all those high end watch shops, and I would go in and look at them. Yeah. And I would be like, Does, do, you have an, do you have a rubber option? And they would bring it out. And yeah. I would be like, man, this feels different. What is this? Yeah. So from all of the high-end brands, the $20,000 and $40,000 watches, I would deep dive, how do you make this and what is it made out of? Because it feels different. Mm. And then I made our bands out of the same thing. Oh wow! So that's why you like yeah. our bands is because it's like, oh, this is this is really good. You're yes, like, uh -huh. that's exactly what was what the is. main company that you kind of were like? This is they get it right. Was it a Breitling? Was it a no? It was uh, Automair's Paget AP, mm -hmm. yeah. and then um, it was mostly along AP. The AP rubber bands, okay, were good. Real hard rubber. Actually, it it's a softer rubber, but it has a tighter density to it. So wow. the way I describe it is it works like rubber, but feels like leather. So when you're mm -hmm. wearing it, it has a very much a leather yeah. feel to it, but it has a rubber performance envelope. So um, I want to say something just like <laughs> oh. insert. That's what she said. Okay. Um, oh yeah. I apologize to my guests for that. It's totally unprofessional of me. Um, moving on to your background. I'm going to ask you what your background is because I don't want to overstep because uh, not only are you the CEO and owner of Eris Watches, but you have an experience and background. So I'll let you lead the way on that. Uh, my background is I was a law enforcement officer pre-9-11. Post-9-11, I went to the Air Marshal Program, Yep, spent a few years there, and from the Air Marshal Program, went to the Department of Defense. So at DOD, um, I was at the agency, so that's where I met you. Yeah. Um, and was there, I did, I like to say I did 13 years of a three year contract. So I think I did. So you okay. were DO, you were DOD as an agency body, but okay. The, but you were farmed out <laughs> to the agency. Yeah. So uh, I we're talking in, about the CIA. Let's just put that out there. I mean, people are like, what's well, the agency? It's like, it's not an insurance agency. It's CIA. It's uh, yeah. Jake. It's state farm. Me and Jake. Yeah. You, I, um, I'm interested because, um, some of the best instructors I had in the CIA, one, I, I often reference you. Uh, I think 
from my experience being in uh, the Global Response Staff Office, which isn't classified. I mean, it's classified to talk about the deets of that. But you have some of the most competent shooters in the world. And what I was impressed by, most of my firearms instructors like you had an air marshal background. Um, and, you know, like when, when special operations guys go to those kind of jobs, um, law enforcement, because security is part of it, are the bread and butter of those mechanisms, those action arms, those elements within those interagencies. And the most competent, capable instructors and shooters that I saw outside of the, our program that were teaching us were air marshals. Yeah. And you were early on in the air marshal process, right? Yeah, it's time on the gun. So when I went into FAMS, uh, FAMS stood up. I put my application in with everybody else. Uh, later on when I was leaving, um, I, I worked out of the Chicago field office of the air marshals. And later on when I was leaving to go to the agency, uh, I was leaving because my dad was sick. So my dad got diagnosed with stage four cancer. I was working on the Chicago field office. I'm from the Pacific Northwest originally. I wanted to go back and spend time with my dad. So I went through the whole thing. Want some time off? Can I transfer to a different field office? Like I'm not trying to miss mission time. Yeah. I just would like my days off to spend time. And they didn't want anything to do with it. Of course not. And so what he said to me, what the head of our field office said was, Matthew, 327,000 people applied for this job. And he's like, if you don't want it, leave. And I was like, cool. Okay. I Peace mean, out. That's, yeah. See ya. Um, wow. So when I was there. And he uh, called you Matthew. How, he did. Dick. Yeah. I mean, it's my name. So he <laughs> it is, but it's like when he, Michael, when he was dressing me down and he didn't give me like my own. Coaster. Th- yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> my creds had my name on them. Um, but interestingly enough with that, uh, I was the, the class I was in was the last of the plank owners. So when I left, I got a wood plank. Oh, so you guys were the first class to stand it up kind of. No, I wasn't in the stand up class, but I was the last of that first group they brought on, right? Because they hire in mass. Yeah. And and so I was the last of the plank owners. But the the, the defining characteristic of that organization at that time was shooting. Yeah. So you had to be a competent shooter. You couldn't get away with not. Burned in my eight week course with 30 other dudes. We did 2.4 million pistol rounds, and we only shot for four hours a day. Half of your day was learning, like, the Constitution and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, this is how federal agents are, like, wear pants. Yeah. You're a federal agent now. Um, And then, yeah, so 2.4 million rounds. So I was there for four years, and I had three duty guns. Went through three SIG 229s. I'd turn them in at 80,000 rounds a gun. Wow, because they're getting burned out. You just burn them, run them. Wow. SIG 229 so, was your actual... Yeah, 357 SIG. Interesting. Yeah. I assume 357 no for... No thought. No. Oh, really? Yeah, no I thought. I was thinking uh, terminal ballistics. Mm, no. Uh, at stand-up, yeah. they pulled leadership from Secret Service. Duty gun at Secret Service was 357 SIG. So they were like, we got a whole room of them. Hand them to these guys. <laughs> so there's no... And I'm kind of a... I mean, I say I'm not a gun guy. Yeah. But from the teaching background and the working background, I kind of like to deep dive stuff. Yeah. They didn't that's, want to hear that's it. the reason. It's in the armory. That's why you got it. So, performance for the platform, performance for the aircraft, all that. N- n- no, like I mean, you those, would think the biggest consideration would be shooting a gun within the confines of a linear target that's flying in the sky. Yeah, Not and a you're consideration. punching around, yeah, through somebody, and then through somebody, and then. Through, right, you're yeah. in a linear environment that is just body. So no ammunition uh, uh, look at it at all either. Right? Hollow point, full load. There you go. And you're wow. like, wow, okay. So the only consideration that I believe, I would think you would want to be was, subsonic. We have an armory yeah. full of these, and we can hand them to dudes tomorrow. Huh. So it was. Like, would you okay. want to be subsonic? I would. I mean, I'd yeah. want to be a big fat bullet. Yeah, not moving very fast. Exactly. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So it was a lot of shooting. So I took that platform of a lot of shooting, which I was the top shooter. So mm-hmm. I have the little plaque that says like, hey, here you go. Um, so I was able to maintain that level. So then in going to the agency as an instructor, getting hired into that program specifically to teach, you're yeah. coming in to be part of the teaching cadre. It gave a really good foundation to be able to run a gun. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting to me is in that teaching role, having you guys come through, 
you can, I can, you can stand on a firing line and pick from a group of guys where they came from. You can be like, you're an army soft dude. You're a Navy guy. Just on the way, they manipulate, touch, and deal with a weapon system. You can call it from across the room like, hey, this is what that guy is. So because part of my ability is kind of a photographic memory, Yeah, I can read all of those manuals, get raised on all of those things in my law enforcement life, and then be able to translate them to ways that you would know. So mm -hmm. when you show up and I'm like, okay, this is an army soft guy. I know exactly his template. So when I'm going to bridge our learning and use a teaching point, yeah, I can speak your language and give you something where you're like, yeah, I got it. You know? It's insanity. I mean, I mean, when you first saw me, you thought I was in the Coast Guard. So that you might have been. Well, like, I mean, a lot of that guy. is there's a, <laughs> that's a. His shooting tactics weren't that good. I was like, yeah. I thought, does SF not issue weapons anymore? <laughs> Are you like a You're holding deep, you upside down. deep undercover guy? Like you took <laughs> it's low vis. You took FID mission like to the extreme <laughs> where you're just holding a saber. Like Mike <laughs> Michael, pick up the rifle, please. Well, I was you know what's crazy is um I've been around a lot of instructors, obviously being a Green Beret and and seeing a lot of learning processes. I was most impressed by the course that I met you in, which is a firearms development course. I think to show us what right looks like getting qualified to be able to train certain employees within the agency. And it was a cool instructor course. I mean, it, instructor courses are like new to SF. I mean, when they required that you do an instructor teaching course where they taught you how to teach, people were offended. But learning that made me more competent as an operator in that job, but also, man, it, it like leveled up all my instruction. And all the instructors we had were great, but for you stood out. I mean, I, th I think you came in when we were doing our calls and then we were transitioning to doing our teach backs. And then you you had a block of instruction and you know everybody who came to us was competent, competent. And then I saw you and I'm like, damn, this dude is like teaching me things that I've never learned before and I've learned almost everything, right? And I didn't think there was like any other way to go. And I remember you taught us, and I, in my teaching block for Gunfighter Carbine, I teach that you taught me this. Uh, I use a lot of teaching points from that, that experience. But you were talking about shooting with both eyes open with a carbine. And a lot of people drive it. And understanding the principles of the ergonomics of transitioning to offhand is important. But nobody actually does it. And in fact, in nine combat rotations with hundreds of gunfights, I've never done it. And a few times I remember I had the opportunity to do it, but I'm not going to do something and risk the confident position that I hold. And you're like, guys, just take the buttstock and transition it to your left uh, uh, shoulder stock and shoot with both eyes open and then use that not giving a lot of your body up. And I was like, oh, booge, like mind blown. And I couldn't believe it. Um, and you were like one of the most competent uh, shooters I've seen in demonstration, which I thought was amazing. Well, how you. did you get to that point? Well, part of that goes to how I learn. So I recognized early on, and I still continue to do it today, that I learn differently. So being a student throughout my life mm. and being able to understand why do I fail at this in an academic environment but excel at this in an academic environment was cracking the code on how I learn. And once I cracked the code on how I learned, I was able to then look at all of you and be like, so there's a difference between instructing and teaching. And what most of the experience that you've had in your life comes from, in your professional life, comes from somebody standing in front of the group and reading a program of instruction, right? Yeah. Uh, without, uh, without aid of reference or notes, the yep. instructor will be able to, and they read these points off. Well, you might not need those points. You might stand there and I might look at your grip and be like, man, Mike doesn't have a grip problem. What Mike has is he's, you know, fill in the blank and then teach to that. So my wife's a teacher, has been a teacher and comes from a teaching family. I would have loved to have been in a different life of my own, a teacher, an educator. And what I defined early on from those around me, especially my dad, is... Um, not 
instruction, but teaching. And a teacher has a vested interest in your learning. Mm. And that's the difference. You've yeah. been to programs of instruction where they don't have a vested interest in your learning. Yeah. They're like, I'm going to read this to you, and then you're going to go do that it. that block. Like, that's not how people learn. Yeah. And that's not how, if, the, if my job at that organization, right, if 13 years of a three-year contract means I'm doing my job well, then to do that job well, that means you have to perform better. Mm. So if I can go into a room, take where everybody is on a baseline, and then when I leave that group, show marked improvement and understanding and application. So specifically what you're talking about, from right-handed carbine to left-handed carbine, why would I ever? So I'm a principal guy. So I always go to the principal and the fundamental. Mm -hmm. And if I'm better shooting right-handed, I can't eat left-handed, Mike. Like I can't put a fork in yeah. my left hand and eat. Try to wipe your ass. Why would I move a gun yeah. there yeah. in a more adverse environment? So my response to that is to question it from the beginning and say, why am I, why am I switching hands? I'm a better fighter right-handed. Yeah. The optic doesn't know if I'm left-handed or right-handed, mm. it's just a dot. Mm -hmm. So then take that environment and manipulate it. Move the buttstock over and press the trigger. I'm better off my left shoulder with my right hand than I'll ever be with my left hand on my left shoulder. So then why compromise? Mm. So part of what I think teaching is and learning is being able to, a growth comes from being able to question, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And then what I would often do is start my lesson plans at the end. Mm. If this is what right looks like, where was I like frames of a movie? Where was I one frame before that? Mm -hmm. And one frame before that? Because when I back that out to us starting that class, mm -hmm. then where do I need to start from? Mm -hmm. Right? Like a lot of that stuff, you're a army guy. You've lived an entire life where they're like, pack more shit in your rucksack. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. At the end of that, how much of that stuff did you never use? Yeah. And you're like, yeah, but I still brought it. And you're like, hey, man. If we look at what right looks like at the end, we can pair a lot of that away. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Like so that's where that came from. And what you saw, like now we're talking about how I built it. And what you saw was the result of what it looks like from your angle, right? Mm, like yeah. from the receiving angle of that. And so that just says to me that like I, I built it okay. Like it, it landed with somebody. Yeah. You, it, it, generally speaking to all the guys that I communicate with, I, even Jack Carr, we talked about on the podcast. Um, you are one of like the best communicators of information in in that field that a lot of guys have seen. Because I think a lot of the military guys who showed up are used to the POI. Spill. Well, and they're already exceptional people. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, your the standards for getting into that program at that time mm -hmm. are very high. Yeah, and then it's like, well, then what can I provide? And yeah. what I need to provide is the finish work. Mm. Is the if you're really quick out of the holster and if you're really quick on the trigger and if you're really good, then where do I pair that down? How can you be faster out of the holster yeah. and quicker on the trigger and, and start to recognize it from that way? And, and I noticed because probably the left and right limits of all the people that you're exposed to, from the person who doesn't know how to hold a gun yeah. to the person who's showing up who's a competent gunfighter and just needs tuning, You've seen it all, I imagine. Yeah, it's a bit. There was, there was that whole array. Yeah, has been through there. Let and me ask then you. my job becomes: How do you unlock that? Yeah. How do I unlock your learning for that platform to make you perform? And the other issue of that is the reality of that. Where are you performing? And you're like, well, I'm performing. It's like the line from Armageddon, where they're like, okay, so the worst possible case imaginable. And they're like, yeah, it's the worst possible thing imaginable. And you're like, yeah. So I'm with that reality. If that's what right looks like you winning in a gunfight, whether you're a analyst that's never fired a weapon before, or whether you're a tip of the spear guy, the performance still needs to be the same, Yeah, right? Yeah. A gunfight for a small town cop is the same as a gunfight for some deployed guy. It's the fight, you're right, you're dancing with the devil. So then it became, how do you guide that person to there? And that's the overriding principle of everything I used is a teaching methodology referred to as guided discovery. Mm. where I'm just the man taking you across the river, Mike. 
Yeah, I love that. I'm moving you from point A to point B. Yeah. I'm going to point some things out along the way. I'm going to show you. And when you get to the destination, I'm going to be like, be well, sir. And you're going to be like, see you, buddy. And you're going to go off and take it. So, I feel like you give me your pinky and I just hold my hand around your pinky. You just slap people with my fat pinky, right? <laughs> like you're like, or you throw it down like a challenge. Be like, I have Graham's pinky. Yeah. I, I uh, uh, when I went through that training course, I was super impressed by it all. It, it, the agency does a lot of things right in, in the training field. Mm. I'm interested to get your feedback on, uh, you because you've seen it all, especially in that, that training curriculum. Who do you think, out of all the agencies that you worked with, who do you think has the hardest shooting quals, the highest standard, and the most competent shooters, actual shooters? Well, it, I can't answer that from a standpoint of the context is different from everyone. Roll to roll. Right? So, yeah, yeah a, a keg guy, is their stuff high and hard? Yeah. And does it fit what they're, like we said earlier when I was like, you can stand on a range and say where people came from without even meeting them. Yeah. Because that tone, it's the difference between an NASCAR driver and an Indy driver. Hmm. Like which one is harder? And you're like, well, they're both equally extremely difficult. They're hmm. very technical for the environment that they're in and they don't necessarily translate. So yeah. what I had to do was say, strip all that soft shit away because now you're working this program. A specific it's, job. It's going to look differently. It's yeah. going to act differently. And you're going to have to be different. So interesting. Um, and so what I would typically start with with guys with that in that program is they're used to, I mean, there's 12 guys on your A team, mm -hmm. right? And if you're going to go hit an objective, that can be 30 guys, mm -hmm. a blocking force and all this other stuff. And you'd be like, okay, let's just take those 12 guys. If each of those 12 guys has a primary role and a secondary role and then a tertiary role, take them away. And then who's left having to do all 12 jobs? Mm. You. Mm -hmm. So if you have to do all 12 jobs, how important right now is the fifth job? And you're like, well, it's not. I'm going to ignore it. Mm. And I'm only going to do my primary task is fixing this problem. Mm. So it's kind of giving a wider scope and understanding of what do I need to be doing right now to get to where – the X is with what right looks like. Yeah, because it's not always black and white. No, and some of that yeah. you ignore. Some of that is like, oh, I must stack here. And you're like, hey, man, every up until the past decade, and I would say probably five or six years, every training course anyone could ever go to in this country that dealt with tactics was built off a team, right? Like there are people that still care. And I will say this to you. There are people that still care what side the knob is on and the hinges are on. And I don't give a shit about either of those. You're alone, right? I'm yeah. one man. Why do I care about which side the knob and the hinge is? While I'm standing out here trying to figure out the swing of a door, I'm in a hallway, right? That's huge, man. In a basement. Yeah. On a 50th floor. Like I have all these other things environmentally, but the template that I'm taught from is a program of instruction mm -hmm. that some guy learned somewhere else. And he's like, no, this is how you stack. You're like, stack? You're alone, bro. I know. It's just like you and a Glock yeah. 17. Yeah. Homie. And it might not even be your Glock. It might be you and that guy's wheel gun. Because while we were over here bullshitting, he's the first guy that went down. And you're like, oh, guess I'm shooting a 38, right? Like, is that is that curled thumbs? Like, how do you, So to me, it's principles. Learn the principles, teach the principles, right? If I can, if my father can teach me the principles and I can go forward and teach those to my kids or people that I come across with, then that propagates a baseline that is not just thinking about me. It's thinking about a program of instruction is instructor based and teaching is student based. Hmm. And I'm more concerned about a student than I am about, I mean, obviously I'm sitting here with you. I run my own company. You do too. Neither one of us are there anymore. Mm -hmm. So it was, I'm more, it's not me focused is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Right. I wasn't there being like, Oh no, I'm going to, I'm going to let you guys tell me I'm great. No, man, I'm here for you. Yeah. So, and well, now I just carry that on into this next thing. Well, I, I think that's a lot of the things that you mentioned when I teach for Phil Kraft survival or even the methodology that the company teach culturally, a lot of people go, that's not how it's done. It's like, you're, you're not understanding the end objective or even the client. Most of the things that I teach is defensive based, but it's also about singleton or single individuals having to navigate a complex circumstance 360 degrees. So that's very different in the 
the person who's an operator, who's the Navy SEAL, who's only used to working with, with teams. That evolution for me as an instructor, but also as an individual, only came when I was handed a carbine by Evan Hafer, and he's like, single man CQB, go in there, rescue the good guy, kill the bad guys, good luck. And I'm like, uh, there's nobody with me? Like, how the hell do I skin this cat? And they had the tactics, techniques, and procedures to navigate that story. And then when I teach civilians, I'm like, man, this is the closest thing connected where you're in a semi-permissive environment, you and a pistol, and you have to survive on your own. So a lot of the things that I learn institutionally have nothing to do with what I'm teaching civilians yeah. technically. And I would say one of the foundations of that is because everything that you learned institutionally, all of those teams you, de you, you describe are all fighting based. Yeah. That's why you're there. Yes. We select you, we vet you, yep. we school you, we do all of this stuff because you're going to go fight. I'm a grown man with a family of six, right? Mm -hmm. Why would I ever want to fight? Yeah. Nothing good is going to come of this. Yeah. So for me, if we're looking at what does right look like, right looks like me sitting at home tomorrow, <laughs> sipping on coffee, coffee, having a great time. Yeah. So, hey man, if I, if there's no reason for me to go in there, why would I ever go in there? Yeah. If my primary job is to keep me and mine safe and I can do that by whipping a U-turn without ever exiting my vehicle in the middle of the road, hey, I'm going to do that yeah, and be a winner in that engagement. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey man, just because, you know, it's, it's that people that like to fight don't come from a fighting background. Mm -hmm. Right. So all of that, that we see now in culture, we're like, no man, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. You're like, why would you ever want to do this? Mm. Um, they, uh, they say it, they virtue yeah, signal it. Yeah, but they it's don't, not, yeah, yeah. It's one of those where it's like, you know, it's, you see it in combatives and all that stuff. You're like, hey, man, you've never been punched in the face before if you think that you know it's yeah. going to go the way you think it's going to go. Yeah, you don't want that um, fight. Yeah. Because if you see what it looks like, you would, you'd, yeah. you'd want to do a lot of stuff to not go in that room. Yeah. Yeah. Skip the flowers and chocolates this Valentine's Day and get that special someone a hot, steamy mug of Black Rifle Coffee. BRCC is having a buy one, get one sale February 3rd and 4th to help you get all your last minute shopping done. Because we know you forgot to do it earlier. No, we won't tell them you forgot. Aside from getting a free bag of coffee, you can also shop our new Valentine's Day collection filled with badass patriotic gear that says, I love you almost as much as I love America. This brand new collection has a ton of new designs to choose from, including hoodies, tees, hats, and a pair of mugs that Coffee Cupid would approve of. Stock up on America's coffee this Valentine's Day with this epic BOGO sale. For decades, buying a silencer has been difficult. But in 2005, Silencer Central set out to simplify the suppressor buying process. So what happens when you buy from Silencer Central? Well, they help you find the right silencer for you. They handle the paperwork so you don't have to. And they give you a free NFA gun trust so you can share your suppressor. Silencer Central allows you to pay while you wait. They make sure your purchase is carefully prepped, packaged, and protected until the moment you're approved. Once approved, they deliver it straight to your door. So whether you're planning your next hunt or putting together a range day, you'll enjoy every shot you take with Silencer Central, straight to your front door. So um, I want to mention um, these socks because I'm staring at them and my feet are starting to sweat profusely. Apparently, we get a lot of complaints about our hobbit feet my hobbit feet. I, I try to blame guests, but most guests have shoes on. I have beautiful feet. Beautiful feet. They're so, like, every time I take a picture of my feet, I get DMs. I, I'm just saying, conversion. Um, darn tough. I don't have any sponsorship with them. You know what I did? I looked up an American company that sells socks. This isn't a commercial for them, but I, I like plugging them because you guys said, I don't want to see Mike's hobbit feet anymore. I wear a size 13. You wear a size 15. Yeah. So if we just had these feet naked, Good God, we would it's break the internet. It's 28 inches of feet, <laughs> which that's is actually, yeah, feet. that's my band name. Gross. 28, 28 inches of feet. Inches of feet. Uh, that needs to be a shirt, yeah, man. That needs to be, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so darn tough out of Vermont. They're American made. And um, yeah, they have a little, and I like they have little coyotes. Yeah, and, they're, I they're mean, cute. I want to use the word cute. They're very cute. I like, yeah. thank you. Like you yeah. handed me these and I, I wasn't wearing socks. Yeah. I was in my slippers. Yeah, um, size 15 feet just walking around the house. I yeah. feel like you're wearing shoes. Well, at that point with 15, it's kind of like you own it, right? You know what I mean? Like, what is Earth going to do to me 
<laughs> with these feet. How tall right? are you, Matt? Uh, six five. Yeah, six five. How much you weigh? Uh, about two sixty five. Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. So and then I got these hands. Yeah, and, that are and like, there's not many people who have the, the si- shooting same right size there. hand as me. That right there. And that, it's like that's why massive. you shoot 100 percent perfect every time. Is <laughs> because I got this platform where I'm not moving, I'm not rocking back. Yeah. And then I got these hands that just kind of absorb everything. And I it's love like that, oh. man. Oh, the other part of that, oh, real quickly, because we have a shared background with uh can we say CQD? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I call so, it. We actually so, call it close quarter defense. Yeah. yeah. So uh and that is I'm naturally pigeon toed. Oh, and that stance is toes in, knees in. Oh, so when I went to that vetting yeah. and was going through selection, and that hood comes up and they're beating your ass, one of the things they look at is like, "How are your feet?" Yeah. Well, naturally, I default to pigeon toed, and they're like, like, "Man, you're great, a badass." You're good, man. I'm like, "Well, yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm not mean pigeon toed. Yeah, I'm actually retarded, but I'm like, it's <laughs> it's just helping me now." I so, love yeah, that. That was hilarious. I, that was my little thing that I never <laughs> mentioned was one of the guys there uh, would always whisper to me be like man your stance is solid dude like you're like this is it like you're you're good you're like you're, i can't help it you're a go i was born that and way. i was like yep i practice <laughs> you're just like <laughs> um what what is what is the hardest call that you because you've seen all the calls and i've i have an opinion on this but i'm interested in your opinion because you've shot all the calls and you've probably taught all the calls what is the hardest call in the federal government that you've seen for for shooters the dea used to have a call i don't know if they have it anymore but the thing that the dea used to do was it was timed but they wouldn't tell you the time Mm. so the further you were away you had more time the closer you got the times would be faster oh and they didn't give you the time wouldn't tell you they wouldn't say just be like hey man when timer beeps or target faces do what you need to do they're like shoot fast yeah and so that i liked i liked it and there was this whole thing at my time at the organization one of the things that i kept pushing through writing and discussion with other leadership people is the idea of a quantification, not a qualification. We shoot these qualifications and a qualification to me is worthless. Yeah. It's a quantification. Yeah. So while you're shooting, yeah. are you moving? Are you processing time? Are you having to communicate? One of the quantifications or qualifications we had at the air marshals early on was you would start seated in actual aircraft seats and all of the mannequins around you, they had real human hair on them. So as you're shooting, you got, you got inoculated to hair flipping over your front side and seeing all of that. You would just get like, yep, I can use the path. There's a huge pathway between the side of the head, the outside of the ear. Wow. And the skull. Yeah. Right? That inch yeah. can look a mile wide at times. Yeah. Threading the needle. Yeah. Um, so it was needle. just all of this stuff. So it dealt with starting in your seat and then getting up and moving and communicating to someone else so how you talked how i love you, that yeah it was it was it was it sucked i mean it was tough um there was the other part that i've always enjoyed is two things i enjoy driving and i enjoy shooting mm-hmm. neither one of those have ever been stressful to me yeah so i just drove down here from an hour north of seattle mm. right easy day mm-hmm. and when i got out of the car at my buddy's house last night i'm like hey man i think i have adhd He's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, when I'm in a car, whether I'm in it for 30 minutes or 12 hours, it's exactly the same. Same. Yeah. I just get out and I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. And same. it, everyone I'm with, he's like, man, you would you stop like four or five times to go to the bathroom? And I'm like, no, I stopped once. Yeah. Like, why do I, why would I? So, so with shooting, it's similar in that I don't have a physiological response with stress mm. to performance. Yeah. So when I was in the FAMS, we were shooting, we had to go through our series of quals at our finishing school out in New Jersey, and everybody's on a line. And it's not just my class, it's like people from other, right? Everybody comes into this thing and you're, you're doing it. And so you'd have a primary instructor with you and you'd shoot the entire card of drills and they'd just go through and mark off if you were a go or no go. And I would hear guys along the line on other sides, I would hear instructors say to shooters, unload, show clear, place the pistol on the cart. And then I would continue to shoot these other drills. And in my farm kid brain that takes a time to process Mm -hmm. stuff, I was like, man, when do I get to do that? Like, what am I doing wrong that I'm not progressing to where they are? Right? And it was the opposite. Yeah. So I take a minute when I'm stuffing mags to turn and look when a guy said that. And I'm like, oh shit, they failed. Mm. Like they are failing their qual 
and the instructor is saying, unload, show clear, and place the pistol on the cart. And they're leaving and going to get on a bus. And I turned back around and I'm like, I don't want to hear that. Like, I don't, like, I don't, I cannot, uh, there's zero part of me that can allow that man to ever say to me, unload, show clear, place your pistol on the cart. So I was like, oh, like, that's not, that's not the winning, that's not the winning line. That's the the other line. Well, I I, I love how, I love how that vetting process worked because um, you showed up, you called proofing your resume. It wasn't training. It wasn't instruction. It was vetting your resume. And I showed up with a lot of gangsters in special operations. Like these dudes were like the best of the best. At the time, I was a Sergeant Major in 19th group. I was, uh, I felt like I had a good path. I, I, as you didn't have physiological responses under stress, I could sit there numb to the earth and just shoot the call. And when I went through and called pistol carbine, all the stuff, I was the only one, me and this other dude named Chuck, who um, I actually served in the SIF with. We actually did a rotation together. We were the only ones to shoot clean pistol and carbine. Everybody else had a reshoot, and we lost half the class. And half the class is some of the best shooters in the world. Yeah. I mean, the best operators in yeah. the world. And I'm like, we just shot for a six-figure job, and if you didn't qualify, you go home. Yeah. <laughs> so you're unemployed. Yeah. yeah. And so it's not like you're qualifying for a, 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 a specific mission set or a specific role. You didn't get the job unless you shot and yeah. got in. Yeah. And th- then it began. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, this is crazy. Like, like the, the psychology of like, I just flew in and I'm a badass and then you don't call and then you're on a bus and then you're going home yeah. unemployed. Yeah. That's, that's pressure. That's actual real life pressure. Yeah. So now imagine me in a teaching template yeah. having to walk into a room full of you yeah. and be like, I'm here to teach you something. <laughs> like that has to take the thing. And that, yeah. that's why I enjoyed the guided discovery methodology. Is yeah. like, hey man, there, Mike. There's not a lot I'm going to be able to teach you, right? Yeah. Like you've shown you're exceptional. Mm-hmm. Now, what I can do is we can start to pare some stuff away. And it was like, okay, well then let's just focus on that. And there mm. were guys that I would go to, and I'd be like, hey, there's not a lot I can do for you. What do you want from me? Yeah. And guys would be like, nothing. Like just tell me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. hey, I don't really need anything. Just let me know if like you see me. Yeah. Going off road. And then I'd be like, okay, cool. Yeah. And then there's, you know, and that's fine. And I, and I enjoy that because my teaching style and I've been, and I've, and it's not just a teaching style, it's a leadership or just my style of person that I am is I don't give unnecessary feedback. I'm not the guy that's going to stand on your line and make shit and be, up. Yeah. And tell you things. A lot of guys do. Yeah. And so even now at Aries, when I'm dealing with like all the people that work for us, like, hey, if you're crushing it, I'm just going to be like, hey, man, good morning. You know, how you doing? Let me know if you need anything. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to be in there. We, we hired a young woman uh, as our quality control head. And she was she came in after like the first week. And she's like, hey, when are we going to do my performance review? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, when are we going to sit down and talk about how I'm doing? And I'm like, you're here. That's how you're doing. And I, I was love like, that. Yeah. And I was like, you want to know what? There will never be a day. And this, you know this because you know me, I've, I've probably never told you this, but what I told her was there will never be a day where I believe in you more than the first day you arrived. You had it all. Mm-hmm. You have every part of my belief in you was there. Mm-hmm. So just keep doing it. Yeah. Right? Like, I'll let you know. You can only go downhill yeah, from I'll here. let you know if you steer, <laughs> but there's not, like, I'm not going to be like, oh, I like you better. Yeah. No, man, I'm all in. Yeah. So it's like, I'm all in. I know it's not always going to be good. And it's not always going to be highs, right? There's that dip and that value, but it's not a, hey, we're going to have to talk about it. It's just be one of those like, hey, man, clean it up. That's so, I think that's what it was about you that kind of because I, what I, number one, the office, the the there's the, a lot of power in not speaking. Yes, the agency overall. God, I was so impressed by the shoot uh, level of shooting. I, the, the level of technical I have proficiency, nothing, dude. I've, I have two out of seven million things that I could say badly about that organization. I think it is exceptional. Exceptional. Yeah. And and I, I remember the feeling of going, I saw the process, I trust these guys, and I'm in the middle of a foreign country and bad guy land, and I know this dude has just as much skill set and competency, and I trust this situation. And it, it made you feel that way. And in that instructor development course I went to, 
I was like, damn, there's some talent here. And it was it, it was fun because it bumped me up a level because it made me push harder. And then me and the guys competing where I'm like, ooh, this dude thinks he's better than me. And we're kind of at the best. And then you came in and you weren't like reinventing the wheel, talking to talk. You were just focused on tweaking us and improving us from the from our baseline, not imagining, oh yeah, I, I do the same SOP spill every single time. And you were very adaptive. And that's what I recognize different as an instructor. And this is decades or over a decade yeah. ago. But I went, man, that's powerful. And I actually took that. And when I started my company, a lot of the way that I taught wasn't as a Green Beret teaching Afghans. It was kind of what I saw you teach as what right looks like teaching other civilian type people in that environment, which had a profound impact on me. Well, what you need... From from my teaching side is when you're in a, when you're in the same room that a guy like Evan is in or a guy like Jack would be in is you all need different things. Yeah. So how ignorant is it of me to take a moment of your time and just read something from a sheet? Like nobody gets anything out of that. Now, big picture, sure, we met the objective of what today was, but that's not that's not my job. So a, when I grew up. Um, my grandparents, for a time, we lived right across the street from my grandparents. And in my grandparents' home, outside of their bathroom, was a little plaque. And I'm talking, I'm like five or six, seven years old. And I would walk by that little plaque all the time. And it said, I shall pass this way but once. Any good that I can do or any kindness that I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer it nor neglect it for I shall not pass this way again. Oh, wow. And I have taken that my entire wow. life of like we, and I used to say it in teaching, you and I are going to cross paths one time. My job standing in front of you in that role was it's incumbent upon me to give you everything I have. So when you leave here and we part ways, there's not a time where I'm driving away thinking, man, I wish I would have told Mike this. Or you saying, he never, like, it's like going to a concert. Man, I wish they would have played their hits. And they don't. And yeah. you have this void. And I was like, look, if we can do that, if my job here as the guide, just taking you from point A to point B, is to reinforce what you have or give a perspective that you may not see, then that's my job. And so I enjoyed it. I loved it. I, I have zero negative thoughts or experiences about that organization through the entire time. That place is exceptional Same. in everything they do. Same. I, um, I don't have anything bad to say about yeah. the organization. A lot of people do. I'm just not one of them. I yeah. had a great experience. Yeah. Um, man, well, you're one of the best. You're one of the best well, instructors thanks. I've ever met. And and this gets us to the transition of the, of the podcast where it's like, how the hell did you go from like being one of the most capable and competent firearms instructors at the tip of the spear of instruction for the guys who are out doing the job and then start a watch company. A series of poor life decisions. Poor? Like it was, no, really? okay, no, that's, <laughs> that's, that's my answer. That's my <laughs> canned answer where people are like, how do you go from like your life to being at the agency? Yeah. Be like it's a cascade <laughs> of poor life decisions. No. Um, so when I left, it was, it was time to leave. I thought it was time to leave and they thought it was time to leave. When you get to that point where yeah. things change. Everybody has been at that point. Yeah. There. yeah. And, and it's just like, okay. Um, so my wife, I woke up and she was like, what are you going to do? Like, what are you going to do tomorrow? Um, and I was like, I don't know. There were some other organizations that I had cross pollinated with in there that, that were still open. But at that phase of my life, our oldest at the time, we have four kids. Our oldest was in high school and our oldest two were boys, youngest two were girls. And it was difficult. I was gone for the bulk of those 13 years. Um, and it was, it was very difficult. And so to me, the most important thing I can be is a husband and a father. Yeah. And everything after Same. that is, I mean, that's what it is. That's my job. If I, how disappointing would it be to, for me to create exceptional operators and have shitty kids? Yeah. I mean, those things that I'm There's a lot of guys do that tasked yeah. with actually raising and creating and developing are going to go off and do amazing things. So when I left, she's like, what are you going to do tomorrow? And I was like, oh, there's other options, but all of those options still took me away. Um, and she said, 
if you could wake up tomorrow and do anything you want to do, what would it be? And I'm like, I'd make watches. I've been in love and fascinated with watches since I was a 12 year old kid. I still got the watch that I bought. Uh, we didn't grow up poor, but we grew up solid middle class. My dad was a firefighter, came home from Vietnam, was a fireman for Seattle. My mom drove a school bus. That's how we grew up. Um, my dad also had a construction company, so he's working two jobs. I worked in the summer on a farm, started when I was 12. Um, and not like on a farm, like I get to drive a combine and listen to Footloose soundtrack. It's like I'm picking spinach or crops out of the ground, harvesting by hand yeah. kind of a thing when I'm 12 wow. all the way through high school. Um, and I bought a watch, spent all my money on this mm. diver watch. Uh, and I've just loved watches the entire time. So to me, in leaving, what am I going to create that can have longevity? If I left and just did the training company that I had, if I ran Graham Combat, which I did for 20 years, right? I was a professional instructor for 25 years. You're on you're on so, YouTube right now. So when right? I... Don't you have a YouTube channel? It might be... Is it you porn? I thought it was a you. I was supposed no, to... No, Pornhub. Was, Okay, that's the t-shirt. They mailed me a t-shirt and they're like, hey, five stars. There's going to be a Graham um, on there. Graham uh, Cracker. Yeah, it's MG. That's where, I would, that's where I would differentiate and be like, that's not me. Um, I, I, you have content though. Yeah, there's, yeah there was, I was teaching some classes yeah. and there was a professional instructor from a big company in the bay next door. Oh. And a production company showed up to film their, that instruction. And in the middle of day one, they're like, this isn't going to work. So they heard me on the other bay and they came over with all their stuff and they're like, Hey man, can we film all these? And I was like, yeah. And so they were set up at the back of the range, but you know me, I'm like a school circle guy. Like yeah. we're going to get in here and do this here. Yeah. And I was like, Hey, get up here. Like you can't see shit from back there. Like get up here. Let's be in this. Yeah. And they stayed for a couple of days. Um, that was awesome. And I, that was it. It's good. I remember reflecting so, on the, on uh, your training experience and looking you up and finding your stuff and digesting it as well as it's good stuff. It's still available. I think online. So to me, there's a finite, amount of time that I can do that. Yeah. There's finite amounts of time to do all of the other things that I could have done, but with a love of watches and a creativity side of like, I, I draw and I make things and I do that. It was one of those where I was like, well, I want to make the timer that I always wanted to have. Mm. Right. Like it's all of these things exist now in the world that we come from because people were like, Nope, this is what it has to be. So, um, in the astronaut program, Randall Knives. So Randall Knives made an astronaut knife because one of the original Gemini guys was like, hey, all this crap you're giving us isn't gonna work. Mm. And I think it was Cooper. Gordon Cooper designed a knife and had Randall make it. So oh, wow. I have one of them sitting behind my desk and it's just the idea of who better, realistically, who better to gauge what time, what mission timer you're gonna wear than coming from an environment where it's like, hey man, everything we do is based on this everything Hard window times. Yeah. of time. Yeah, and then I was like, okay, well, I'll make it. So then I sat down. I wrote, that design, which it would have been a lot easier to like open up a catalog, just like a car. So if you could, you can buy a crate engine. Yeah, you can buy a body. You can build that car. What I did is that design is mine. Mm -hmm. I drew it, the chamfers, the angles, the edges, the fit, everything is mine. So there's no that case that, that, that that's in all of those angles and all of that stuff I always saw. So I'm like, I knew when it was time to sit down and be like, draw what I want. Well, I can draw that. I, I've seen it for 30 years. Yeah. I know exactly what it would be. Now executing it. <laughs> it's been what I've been doing for four years now. Um, what are the biggest challenges in you're creating? Starting? You're creating an entire thing from nothing. Yeah. So like I said, be easier to buy a crate engine. And it's like, yeah, but that's not what I'm doing. So yeah. it's like, okay. So to make that case, you now have to machine that case. We started machining those pieces right here over in Ogden at my buddy's house who I was just at last night. Oh, wow. Um, and then from there, we've built it out. Went to an aerospace company up north uh, by me, north of Seattle. Um, and then now we do it just on the other side of the railroad tracks in our small town of 2,500 people. So all our steel, we cut all our cases, case backs, those components, because in or it's this the simple way to answer that is there's two different things that you're tasked with or challenges that you have at the beginning. 
do you want to make a watch or do you want to build a watch company? Mm. Because they're entirely different. Oh, interesting. And it's like, okay, well, I want to build a watch company. Well, then you got to build all the infrastructure for it. Because you can't go to someone and say, give me a Diver 1 dial. You got to make a Diver 1 dial. You got to be like, this is what it looks. That's why this field watch looks different from that watch. Is I had to draw this differently. This Now, what I did do, which goes back to kind of being principle-based, is this case is the same case you have. Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, how come I can stand in front of you in a a room full of operators and we can have a carbine that right now is a 5.56, but I can swap an upper and it's now a 300 blackout. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, then how come in the watch world, all of these different cases or in the car world, all of these different frames. And I was like, well, then I'm going to design a universal case. Mm. So I'm only having to machine one case that fits two separate. These are distinct from each other. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yet it's the same chassis. Yeah. The movement, this is quartz runs off a battery, but I also have an automatic, Mm -hmm. which is the same case. So it's like all of these design characteristics within it from go have been modular. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why would I ever make it harder for me? Like, yeah. I mean, brother, living in this brain is hard enough. Like, yeah. I don't need to, the last guy I need fighting against me is me, yeah. right? So it's one of those where it's like, okay, well, let's build it and get it done. And now we just keep executing it kind of better every day. Just get better every day. Yeah. Keep moving forward, refine it, make it cleaner, make it better. Now, not only do we cut everything, now we have this partnership with Cerakote where we're using their coating. We are developing with Cerakote the first ever loom used here in the country. Like there's no place that makes loom. So we're doing watch loom right now. Like uh, Cerakoted loom? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, so I, whatever I you it, paint, it's, yeah, it's luminescent. Yeah. Called it Aether, which is like back, like Aries was the Greek god of war and like all that lightning and all the stuff that you yeah. could see with at night was Aether. So it's Ethereum. Oh, wow. um, yeah. So, so the whole gonna, case would be so bezel. Will, yep. All the things that you see right now that glow in the dark, we will be spraying with our own Cerakote that is loom. Yeah. Um, and we have the ability to change those color pigments. So now we can have some reds, we can have some blues, we can have some yellows, we can have some gradient in there that, that makes it a little bit. Yeah. So it's the difficult part with that is everything that we're stepping out to do, we've never done before. Right. Mm. Like the Swiss have done it, you know, Asia does it, Germany does it, Japan does it, I guess it's Japan's in Asia. Um, so there's all of these areas where watches are made, like they've done it for hundreds of years, yeah. you know, in America, they used to do it, the Elgin watch works and Waltham and all of that, but all that's gone. So it's not like you can go to someone and be like, Hey, we're going to start cutting watch parts. I mean, I've done that. I go to them and they just look at me like I'm an idiot. They're like, well, <laughs> what? I'm like, yeah, that's what we're going to make. I mean, if you can... If a machine can cut steel, then just tell it to cut it differently. Yeah. Very small. Yeah. Differently. Just be like, hey, instead of making, you know, if that's a 42 millimeter outside and a suppressor company can cut a 42 millimeter outside can, then why can't we cut a watch? Yeah. Again, like the left side, right side shooting technique. Hey man, the CNC machine doesn't know what it's making. (laughs) I just recognize this. The second hand is a spear. Is that a spear? It's an arrow. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I am I imagine because the best watches that I own, I don't have a lot of watches. Um, I bought a watch when I was in Libya, like a Rolex, gave it to my stepdad, and um it's the nicest watch I temporarily own. I owned some brightlings when I was in the agency. Um what do you have? I had the emergency. Yeah, I had that. I bought that from yeah. a, I bought it from a staff guy. Really? Yeah. I think it was uh what do you do me on that? Three hundred bucks? What? Yeah, three or four hundred bucks. Oh my the god! Ba- the battery was bad. Yeah, and it needed to be serviced. But I'm a watch guy. There's like ten thousand yeah. watches. So I'm a watch guy. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, I, I, and the service on it is extensive. You know, like yeah, yeah. they say. And he's like, so I don't want to send it back to pay the bill. And I'm like, okay, I'll buy it for me. So he sold it to me, and then I did it. I just like replaced yeah. the batteries, put a different gasket in it, and was like, cool. Is that the one? <laughs> uh, yeah. The one you pull. It's analog and you pull yeah. the antenna. Extension. Yeah, it's the, ori- it's the, the original, original emergency. That's the one I had. Yeah, not the uh, new one. The original one. The new one is like super high tech. Yeah. It does digital analog version of it. I think it just tells you. I think it receives a message that just says you're going to die. 
Yeah. And you're just dead. Yeah. Like this is where you, yeah. Pick a spot (laughs) because this is where you're going to (laughs) stay. Um, I, uh, Jack Carr actually on the podcast, um, he said, I need to get a hold of Matt. And he goes, I, I have a Rolex and he was trying to get it serviced in Park City. Yeah. And he went in there and was like, hey, I want to swap the band. And they t- were insulted. That's, I, I can, last night, my conversation last night yeah. was that. <laughs> and driving out here this morning, yeah. which I think every <laughs> law enforcement officer in the region, I think they, if I didn't know that I was living a clean life, yeah. I would have thought something was up because for the 80 miles that I drove this morning into here. Yeah. I had every regional law enforcement officer passing me off. Like one would exit and I'd really? be like, okay, cool. I'm going to open this up and drive a little more. And then the next guy would get on. And I was oh, like, huh. You're new to the area. Yeah. So uh, it's those, my plates say BYU on them. So I think they were just like, yeah, go. <laughs> um, so anyway, on my drive in here, uh-huh. ping. And he's like, hey, I'm trying to do this and this. And then I'm like, well, I'm freaking driving. So I'm trying to answer him. Um, and then he I said got, they were snooty about it. Yeah. Like the, the yeah. Rolex people were like, you want to change the band? We don't do that to degrade value. He's like, yeah. I just want to swap the van. The yeah. band. It's like, that's aesthetically, I just want a different. And they're like, oh, we just don't do that. We can't support that. It's like, get the hell out of here. Like, yeah. what are you doing? Like, that's the best thing about cool watches. That's what you want to do. the band. Yeah. That's why we make the bands we make. Is yeah. Because now you have the ability like i can't change much right like this doesn't change much yeah right it's going to be a variation of a gray same a brown plaid or that's just the way it is yeah um so socks i do and then bands i'll walk in the office and i'll just kind of wander around i'll be like hey what's that and i'll pick it up and swap it out yeah um so are you change are you are you gonna maintenance his watch are you gonna do that thing or yeah he wants to swap the band yeah he wants to do a couple of things so uh, he just said that he was like hey i'll order these up so i'm we are reintegrating some manufacturing here in Ogden. Yeah. Um, oh, you're yeah. Gonna be local. So I've been down here quite a bit. Yeah. Recently, as you you know, like a yeah. couple of weeks ago too. So it was one of those where I was like, "Hey, I'm going to be back in a couple of weeks," and he was like, "Yeah, let's just let's do this." So he's like, "I'm going to order all these things, and then we could just sit around." It's like playing with dolls. It's he loves it. He's a nerd <laughs> like me when it comes to kit and watches yeah. and stuff. I I I associate. Um obviously the best watches with the most expense because you can't get a good watch for a reasonable price. They're just expensive because of the timing, because of the things. Why are watches overall expensive? And I got to imagine just like a shirt being made in the USA is grossly expensive. How do you do that? And what's the balance there? You got to want to do it. Mm. So one of the interesting parts of building the business do you want to make a watch or do you want to make a company? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I want to make a company. And then choosing to do it here as much as we can and keep it here over time, which I'm also looking at it like we're go like our loom is Swiss loom. So those dials are still offshored and all of that because there's no loom that exists. Well, now we're creating a loom with Cerakote. So next year we'll be able to start looming our own stuff. And it's like, okay, so we're bringing that industry in and being able mm-hmm. to do that. Um, movements. Like our movements are Swiss. So on our quartz side, they're a Swiss. And on what does our, that mean? Movement? That means the engine. So like the, the mechanic, like the, the little the gears, engine, the engine in the car. So there's does that come already pre-assembled. Yeah. There's two engines you can do. You can do a battery engine. So just like Porsche's, right. You can have a, uh, a gas car or you can have an electric car. Yeah. So quartz is battery and that's movement. That engine is just a battery movement already done. So we use the best Swiss movement we can. It's a 10 year lithium ion. Cause I hate going to get your battery swapped, right? Yeah. That's ridiculous. So if I'm going to build you a watch in your 20 year career, you should only have to change it twice. Yeah. Seemed reasonable to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then automatic movements, which are the 180 to 237 parts that are all in there and Jeez. finely tuned moving back and forth. So we don't manufacture our own automatic movements. What we use are crate engines from the finest movement maker in Europe, largest watch company in the world, Swatch Group. Remember Swatch? Yeah, yeah. They're the largest watch group in the world. They own Mm. all the other brands. So we use their movements. So the movements that they put in an Omega, that they put in a Breitling, that they put in all their brands, we use that same movement. Oh, wow. And that creates a start point for pricing, I imagine. And then what we do is we take our watchmakers, our trained craftsmen and women who are as good as any watchmakers in the world. And they, like a handmade 1911, 
they sit down with that movement and tune it. And then we put that tuned movement in the timer and it goes out the door to you. Wow. So should our automatic watches be more? Yeah, they should be a lot more. Yeah. Um, is this automatic diver? That, or? One, the, the, that diver one that you have that I just brought you, that's that's a quartz. Okay, awesome. And you can see the difference because it ticks. Versus and on sweeps. Sweeps. Yep, tick and sweep. Now, what you'll also see that we get hit on a lot is your second hand may not hit every second minute. Right? Like you look at it and you're like, oh, it's not directly on the number. Oh, yeah. I can see it right now. It's in between. Yeah. Then do you know why? Why? Because a human put it on with their hands and built that by hand. So when people are like, hey, but I can go buy a, and they fill in the blank. It was a robot. Quartz watch. Yeah. It's not made by a person. Yeah. And I'm like, we're making these. So you get the error. So when you from, time that, uh, you're timing it by hand on a microscopic level under yeah. 10 power magnification. It's... It's like nods. Everybody's just sitting in there with magnification making Dorking these. Dorking out. Things. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We had, um, have you had Doug Pattison on, former case officer guy that works within the? No, um, Jack, I think has. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he sent us one of the uh, one of the watches from his collection that needed tuning. And it was one of the watches uh, that was issued to the ox cart guys, the pre SR 71 oh, wow. agency pilot stuff. So wow. that was in the office for a while. And we were, we had our head watchmaker. She was working on that. That's amazing. Yeah. It was pretty cool. He's like, Hey, I think you're the guys that should work on this. Wow. And so it came in and he sent a bunch of stuff with it. And like the pro the, the, the background of it, you know, like this whole, the provenance of like, this is where it's from and what it is. And it was pretty cool. So I, I found uh, um, the coolest thing I've ever found watch wise was a stealth fighter watch that was given to stealth fighter pilots yeah i was in the air force academy t uh doing combatives with the or the wrestlers and walked out the parking lot and it was sitting in the parking lot and i picked it up i was like oh, that's mm. interesting look at the back and i forget the name of the watch the brand of the watch an integrity drill yeah watch in parking lot what do you do watch parking lot. so i looked at the back <laughs> keep and it, it had all here. the stealth whatever stuff yeah for the pilot but it didn't have the pilot's name mm. and i was like oh so i put out to the the guys and they couldn't find it. And I was like, "Mine now." Um, well, they, obviously, it's stealth. They can't find him. Yeah, it's, he's yeah, he's somewhere in the sky. <laughs> yeah. I can't get it to him. Um, I when when I look at these watches and I think about, um, for example, Sig. Sig Arms is manufactured in New Hampshire, and it's shocking to walk into a factory and see Americans making guns. Yeah, it's cool. But they do. Are the people who make these watches? Like, do they come, are there, is there a technical expertise foreign or like, are they from Swiss, Switzerland? Or? So here's the interesting part of the Northwest. So I live about an hour north of Seattle. So we're outside of like the occupied zone and the back in the seventies might've been seventies, eighties, uh, Rolex built at North Seattle college, a two year certification program to train watchmakers. So at the college in the Northwest, there was one, and then there's one in Pennsylvania. So the only one west of the Mississippi is in North Seattle. Wow. And one I had, school. Yeah. And I had always wanted to do that, but hey, man, when am I going to go do, right? Like, when do I have yeah. two years to go? I just, so I just, my path was different. Yeah. Um, so years ago, when Rolex decided to leave, the board of colleges decided to keep the school going. So it is still a two-year full program school and out of that come fully trained basically quote unquote swiss watchmakers mm. um so when i started aries i drove down there walked into that room full of those 12 specialists in training and was like hey i'm matt and this is what i'm building and i mean who's in right like wow. it was yeah um and there was a woman that came up to me she's our head watchmaker today she's been with us the longest and she's amazing. And she came up to me and uh, we had a conversation. And when I got home, my wife was like, how'd it go? And I was like, I met our first employee. Now, at this point, summer of 2018, we hadn't manufactured a single thing. Like we're still trying to find what machinists can cut this, where can the prototypes be made? All of that had to be done. So I went in there with, I mean, you've been in a room where I speak to people. I went in there with that. You're I, went in, I went in there as Matt saying, Hey, here's what I believe who's in. Who's coming and, with yeah, me. Who's, here's what I believe in and who wants a part. And so when I got home, she's, my wife was like, how was it? And I was like, I met our first employee today. 
Wow. I'm like, I don't know when we're going to hire her and I don't know what we got to give her, but someday. Um, so she went off, uh, built Submariners for two years. At the Rolex um, factory? And then COVID hit. And the interesting thing about business to me, I don't have an MBA. I didn't go to college. I mean, I went to a couple of colleges a couple of times. That's yeah. my education background. Um, so the idea of what business was pre-COVID, pre-shutdown, and who is successful and who isn't successful, and if I buy into that and see that, I built Aries out of a Connex container in my driveway. Wow. Like that's where we start. It's still there. That's where we do all of our Cerakoting and bead blasting and finish work. So I looked at it as all of these companies are closing they're laying people off. They can go a month and then they're out of money. And I'm like, wait a minute, you're all the ones that for years, if I was in that traditional pipeline, I would emulate and you have nothing. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when they slowed down and she was like, yeah, this is, this isn't working. I was like, we'll be here tomorrow. And she came and is still here and oh. we're building it every day so Did, now so it's rolex later off or so well i mean they I had wanna, a, uh, yeah i don't want to get into their thing yeah. but i mean yeah. where she was working on what she was doing they weren't doing anymore wow. and i was like be up here and so it went from me in the connex to me and her in the connex um and then our oldest our oldest son um got into building all of our courts and service really? and all of it. Yeah. So how cool yeah. is that? So both of my boys work for us. He's down in San Diego. Now he builds all the courts. So he builds the majority of our courts watches out of San Diego. He built this one. Uh, yeah. Really cool. Yeah. hundred percent. How old is your boy? Uh, he's 24. Wow. Caleb is 24. Jonah's 20. Jonah, Jonah's basically at still back. He doesn't, I mean, he's out of the house, so he's an adult, but he works every day. He's basically the ops chief. At Aries, like he's the guy that does everything. So he's all the pack and ship, all the customer service stuff, um, some manufacturing. He does all of the bead blast, all the Cerakote. Um, yeah. And so we went from me sitting in a Connex to now we're six employees. We're building everything there. And yeah, I think I, I think I sent you pictures or something like that. We, we went into, so instead of the Connex, now we're in a, it's 2,500 square foot today but after the first of the year we're bumping it out we're adding another 800 square feet um where we're at and we're just it's fact is it a factory yeah or it, it's yeah. everything so it's a watch it started out is what i needed was more space for the watchmakers yeah the two things that watchmakers need are natural light and snacks so <laughs> i found a place <laughs> got uh, both of yeah, them in town in a new new to yeah. our farm town modern building and uh, it has a southern facing, looks right out on the water, right out oh, on the cool, sound. Oh, cool, man. Um, southern facing exposure. Yeah. So from sunrise to sunset, they've got natural light all day. Yeah. And we're talking like... Why is that important, natural light? Uh, just because you see color and features correctly. So you need natural light into your natural workspace. natural light is real light. That right? you could actually yeah. work. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. As opposed to yeah, synthetic. manufactured or fake light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, natural light just gives you it's natural. Uh, it gives you the best view of what colors are and what, what things are. So it's just the ability to see well. Um, and this place had great natural light. And then it also had a massive bar because it used to be a restaurant um, in, a, in one of its former lives. So it has this 30-foot bar oh, cool. that I turned into uh, a coffee counter. So I bought an espresso machine, bought coffee machines, put all that stuff really back cool. there. Yeah. So we built the whole office out as kind of like a space where you can come. It's for all the Aries family. So it's awesome. Man. Yeah. Are you going to do a pro shop in the front end? Yeah. Sell that's, retail? That, that's all in there. Oh, that's what I'm saying it's all in there. It's Is it, are you out. open for business? Yeah. Right now? Yeah. We opened a year ago. So um, let's talk about your, the, the offerings as we close out this podcast. I want to know. Like, what are the watches that are available now? What are some new additions that are releasing or launching? And then how can people get those? So we make two things right now. We make the Diver 1, which yeah. is a quartz or automatic dive watch. That's our 1,000-meter staple. Yeah. And we make our GMT. So the, the GMT comes from a GRS staffer. 
yeah. where he's like, Hey man, I wanted, I want a two time zone watch. I want a GMT, but I want you to make it. Uh, so a couple of years ago, right after I started, he was like, I want your GMT. And I'm like, man, I'm not going to make a GMT for like five years. And he's like, I've driven around Tyson's corner went to a bunch of shops in Northern Virginia. This is what GMTs cost. I'm mailing you a check for a GMT. And then other two or three other buddies pulled in like, Hey man, Graham's making GMTs. And so they sent it in. They're like, Hey man, here's my check for GMT. So that launched our GMT. So, uh, we do the diver one in the GMT. We're adding the field watch, which is that one. This is new. So this is the field watch, which will also be quartz and auto. I think that's my favorite also in titanium. So we're cutting these out of, yeah, full titanium. I want the titanium one. Yeah. It's nice. It's a good, it's a good fit. Um, I have 100 Swiss engines for a chronograph, mm. top end 7750 Swiss chronographs that have been sitting in my safe for over a year. But a chronograph, that's tough. Like, so like soft missions mm. are hard, right? Mm. Like it's tough. Yeah. So a chronograph to that is like landing on the moon. So I'm like, I'm like, okay, these are, they're, they're going to sit in the safe for a bit until yeah. we can figure out, you know, like when Elon's like, yeah, we're going to Mars. And I'm like, okay, bro, let's, <laughs> let's try to get 500 miles out of a Tesla first. Why is it hard so for a chronograph? Uh, Why is it? Because there's parts. So if you take a device like a GMT, so a, a normal diver one does one function, Yeah. right? That engine measures one time in one aspect. And then if you add a GMT to it, it's, it's doing so in the watch yeah. world, they refer to those engines um, as movements and they refer to all of the complexity of it as complications. Mm. And that's exactly what it is. There's a lot it's of complications. Yeah. yeah. So you're adding chronograph complications to that movement. So you're stacking capabilities and gearing um, and it's tough. Yeah. So it's not something, I mean, something I want to do someday. Um, the, the difficult part of that is our buddy Jack really wants one so he's like hey man when do i get my chrono when i think i'll be chrono? on that board yeah wagon too okay I, I know i know the guys will evan will every uh, yeah it's one of those the the here's the issue though is that's like me coming to you and being like yeah okay mike i'll take one and you're like yeah but i gotta go in the back and fucking make this thing See like this isn't year. just yeah it's not like you're just like hey i'll Let take a hot out, dog. Yeah. you're like you're at a ball game and you're like i'll take a hot dog and you're like well somebody had to make the ballpark yeah like not just you eating a hot dog yeah um so yeah so next year is the field watch mm -hmm. in titanium in both that one's next yeah, year this one 2023. 2023 yep in both quartz and auto um 2024 is going to be the chrono mm. and then We'll go from there. I'm looking at doing a carbon fiber. I'd really love. Ooh, that's sexy. Yeah, I, I don't think I've do, ever seen one of those. No, I want to do a. I want to do a plastic watch. So our watch, our price that point cool. right now. Yeah, our price point is a good price point for what we're at. But yeah. if somebody's going to buy a G Shock, yeah. or if somebody's going to get a Victorinox or a Swiss Army like the Illuminox watch, um, I want to do that. Yeah, like I want to make a two hundred ninety five dollar plastic Aries watch that we're probably going to have to offshore, but we're making it like, mm. this is our spec to our piece to our stuff, which is why in Ogden right now, he's, he's telling me, my buddy Rob is saying like, Hey man, we can, we can build all that injection molding tooling here. Yeah. And we can do all of that here. The, there's issues with that and there's capital involved in that. So, um, but yeah, I really want to do that for longevity. I just think for those that want to be able to get into an Aries, but want to be able to get into it or only can get into it at a 250 or 295. Yeah. Man, there's no, there, I, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Like I, I'm, I love certain G shocks and Luminox Same. things that I've had forever. So, so I look at it like I'd really love to be able to offer that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing. I got an HKP seven, but M8 I also have, yeah, huh? M eight, M 13 or PSP. PSP. Okay. But I also, um, have the Glock 19. Yeah. When I'm feeling like snobby and I'm riding my air cool Porsche, P7 it is. P7 all day. Yeah, but when it's like I'm feeling grimy, I get my pickup truck and I got my Glock 19, it is what it is. Yeah. So I like I, I like the variability in that. And to me, watches are like moods. I want them all. Yeah. Um, especially a, a company like yours that's a grassroots American based company from a dude who's done a lot of epic stuff, man. Like that we me and Jack. I, I keep mentioning Jack. It's like, sorry, I apologize, but it was so fun doing a four hour podcast with Jack. But one of the things we talked about is now more than ever, people 
are very conscious to what they are investing in on their person. Yeah. So if you're wearing from your socks to underwear, the jeans, like I want to wear origin jeans because yeah. they're made in the USA. And these consumer decisions, you didn't care before because there was not the access to the information to kind of understand the story, to do a podcast and, yep. and hear the 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 owner of name company. And it's it's kind of it's really cool that this has become a thing and people are investing in that more and more. You know? It's great to do. I, I am humbled and honored that people wear our stuff. First of all, choose us. Yeah. With and pride. And wear yeah. our stuff. And the neatest thing in the world is when letters, literal letters, come into the office from guys working that That's are like, cool. hey, man, I want to tell you a story about where I was with my watch and what we were doing. That's awesome. And it's and that's why we opened the office. So we get people in. We get so many people that travel, like East Coast, Europe, Middle East, that are like, hey, I'm coming here to share this experience with you because my timer played such a pivotal role in my life. And it's just the coolest thing. That's so, so rad. Yeah. So the other thing I have to say before we leave is I have to thank you. Mm. And I, I won't get emotional, over emotional, but I want to thank you because, let's see if you recognize or know uh, if where section 54 is. Yes, I do. Yeah. So that's my dad's headstone. That's wow. a rubbing that I took off the back of my dad's headstone. So thank you for your service. Oh, no. Wow. Yeah. Tell, before we close out, tell, tell us a little bit about your, your dad. Uh, he was an army guy. Yeah. Grew up. Um, He's already a smart man. Joined, yeah, joined Vietnam yeah. during the draft because yeah. uh, he said going to Vietnam was better than the life I had at home. Wow. So joined Vietnam, joined the army, um, did two tours, was a door gunner, first and ninth air cav back in the time where they were putting like leather saddlebags on the tail booms wow. and wearing, you know, Stetsons and doing all of that. Um, spent his time there was very highly decorated. Uh, well, he's, a uh, his distinguished service cross was bumped down to a silver star. So he was always a little, so when I was a cop, I, some things happened and I received commendations and one of those was the law enforcement medal of honor. Mm -hmm. So he would always, there was a section of time there before he passed away or like I would come in a room and he'd be like, Hey man, what's up? And I'd be like, Oh, that's, that's, you got to like stand up. Cause you're like a, it's like a medal of honor. And, you're like, <laughs> and he would just stand up. Oh, he'd rest, give yeah. me so much. He'd be like, man. Um, and he'd be like, I can't even, I can't even display anything because now you're, you know? Um, so anyway, uh, when he passed away, um, he died of cancer. And before he passed away, uh, I had reached out to Arlington because he rates being buried there. Yeah. And like, As according to the regulations, yeah. yeah, it's like, Hey man, there's yeah. presidents, there's this, and then there's you. Yeah. So I was like, do you want that? And what he said to me was, he was like, I don't want to be a burden. Mm. And I was like, Hey man, like if you, you say you want it and we'll do it. And he was like, okay. Wow. So, yeah. So thank you for that. No, that's, um, that's an amazing tribute too. That's really cool was, that you uh, do that. He's in section 55 yeah, then. 54. He's in section 54 and that's his, that's the, yeah. the sequence number of his yeah. headstone. So yeah. when I looked at it, they were doing a tattoo thing in Pentagon city. Yeah. And so I was standing there and I was like, man, how do I, like, I want to replicate it. And so I took the slip of paper and the pencil and just did a rubbing of it. And as soon as I got through like the four, on five, four, I'm like, Oh, that's the tattoo. Oh, that's cool. Of like the actual rubbing. Yeah. So I walked over, I drove over and then went into the tattoo expo they were doing in Pentagon city and walked around, walked around, walked around. And this one woman was like, Hey, she's like, Hey honey, what do you need? And I was like, nobody will do this. And she's like, what's that? And I'm like, it's the number on the back of my dad's headstone across the street. And she's like, sit down. That's so awesome. yeah. So it's cool. So thank you. No, oh, thank for you. For taking care of him. No, thank you for uh, being on the podcast, Matt. How do, how can people find Aries Watches? AriesWatches.com. AriesWatches.com. Or Aries Watches Co. on uh, on the Instagrams. Yeah, we'll put whatever they say. We'll yeah. put all those links down below. Or come on out to Stamford, Washington, have some coffee. Yeah. Look at how your watch is made, hang out, play some pool, drink some whiskey. 
That's rad. Yeah, that's what we do. We need to make a trip, John. We'll need to do that. Yeah. Uh, guys, um, Matt, thank you for being on the podcast, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Guys, see the links below, all the show notes, and make sure you pick up a watch. I, like, out of all the things that I consume, well, one of the things that I won't compromise is time. And uh, Aries Watches is in my repertoire of watches, and it, it will just be be that i mean because you're i don't think there's one american company that i could think of off the top of my head that does those kind of watches everything else is outsourced across uh, overseas right i don't think there's one <laughs> slurp on that coffee mat slurp one and good all right guys uh closing up the podcast you get check show notes uh, make sure you follow um, matt on all the uh content um uh, thank you for tuning in to the podcast you guys can find this podcast on youtube the Black Rifle Coffee podcast on YouTube. If you're watching the podcast, then you must subscribe also to the audio version. Do both. Why not? And also leave a review because those things help. And leave your comments down below. As always, we like to hear what you got to say. Till next time. Peace out. That concludes today's training. Any questions? Woo! Drum titties, boy!